but hi hi paul how are you hi good thanks gabby yourself yes i'm good thank you monday morning no, monday morning monday afternoon uh, <laughs> so just yeah just getting through the day good. Uh, so we've got a, a collection of questions here um to ask you um and i thought we'd just go straight into it which is obviously a huge topic at the moment is is private dentistry and that shift mm. to private dentistry that we are seeing across the uk yeah as a result of many things um the pandemic being one of them so what impact is this shift to private dentistry having on practice values at the moment yeah a uh, really good question gabby i think um years gone by we started to see a kind of shift towards private dentistry and the gap between value of private practices to NHS practices, NHS practices always sitting greater, that gap's starting to close. And I think what we've seen in the last 18 months, um, in a lot of cases, um, those particularly high-end, larger private practices leapfrogging the value of, a, of an NHS practice. This naturally comes down to, to EBITDA, the profit within a business and the multiple applied to it. Um, but before there was always a bit of sensitivity around private practices. Um, demand was kind of heavily weighted towards NHS. It was perceived as the, the, the safer, more sustainable business. It was less personal um, and there was ultimately less risk attached to it. But um, what we've seen in the, the kind of trend emerging in the marketplace is that there's, there's no slowdown of that shift towards private dentistry just now. Um, some may say that is down to NHS access issues. That's obviously an ongoing um, matter. But um, ultimately, there's, there's private practices that we're in touch with, that we're, we're tracking, that, that aren't necessarily doing NHS treatments privately. This is high-end cosmetic and... and you know, I think the consumer spend, the the, the, the accidental saver like you and I, um, d doing what we're doing right now, the, the kind of zoom boom effect, um, they're seeing themselves on camera more and then they're starting to think, well, I'll, I'll get this tooth fixed or teeth fixed um, and, and spending money to do so. So I think the pandemic's really emphasised the, 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 the consumer spend for private dentistry. Absolutely. I think that's a common theme that's cropped up in many conversations over the last, well, it's been almost two years now. I'm so used to saying 12 months and then <laughs> you blink and it's now almost uh, 24. So yeah, over the last two years, this Zoom boom effect has been a, a massive um, source of, of conversation. I know we've kind of just covered what my next question is going to be, but I think it might be worth asking anyway, which is as demand continues to grow, what is driving this? And you said there, this, um, this ability for people to spend more perhaps and this in growing interest due to video calls like we're doing now but is, is there anything else that you think is having an influence yeah i think just general investor appetite um you know when we look at the the uk marketplace there is about 20 percent, 15 20 percent of the market that's consolidated so the, the yeah. kind of corporate ownership at the, the typically at the high end of the market um they are and still do have ambitious buy and build targets to achieve. So, you know, even because of the pandemic, we we um, still seen a lot of those corporate operators active in the marketplace. Um, there was a pause for a period of time, but um, you know that that was short lived. Um, interest kind of reignited the summer of 2020, and the way the way demand grew from there was was really incredible. And that that's a continued theme. And then when you look at the, the, the independent operator just now, some of which are buying their second, third, fourth, fifth practice, they're building small portfolios. But equally, there's an operator there that, a uh, well, first time buyer who's coming into the marketplace, just looking to secure their position within dentistry. Um, and it, it's a, I, I think kudos to the profession here when you when you look at the initial lockdown and, and that, that dreadful period when it first hit March 2020. Um, particular practices effectively closing, um, triaging and, and urgent dental centres mm. being opened up. Um, despite the second and third lockdowns taking place, um, the profession remained open and that was a real game changer. So I think that, that, that really helped underpin a lot of confidence in the marketplace. So very appealing for an investor, so, so corporate buyer or yeah. independent purchaser. And, and ultimately being supported by 
uh, high street lenders as well. So a uh, really good, uh, re really good, I suppose, view of the marketplace. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that second lockdown, which often is forgotten, I think, because there was, well, for example, schools were, were open during that November lockdown. And I think that was a turning point. And when dentistry was said, you know, you can, you can remain open, um, it really was, it did, it, it made sure that people had confidence in that sector and when it came to january and that third one was implemented i think people very much understood that it was very unlikely it would be shut down again and, and from there on in it's just it just seems to have gone from strength to strength in many ways and and 2021 as well it, it saw an impressive amount of offers for practices um in, in all areas of the uk um is this, is this a pattern and a trend that you expect to see in 2022 yeah I, you know i think we will um i think just now the the issue that we've got is is uh, the demand outweighs supply significantly. I say it's an issue. It's a it's a good dilemma to have if you're a seller, um, and that's helping really drive prices. Um, but but uh, on average, um, Chris and Co will arrange approximately six or seven viewings per practice. Um, ultimately, we're achieving um, a minimum of one offer per two viewings that are taking place. Um, so it just just shows the demand that, that that's there. Um, I think practices there's been a lack of supply coming to the marketplace, and I think that that would be really down to a lot of operators who recognise that um, they, they've they're recovering their business or they're enjoying good times. You know those those kind of points that we spoke about there. I, I, I granted operationally within the NHS there's still difficulties. Um, but many practices that are leaning towards private dentistry, you know, they they they're having a, a a ball of a time just now. Um, so I think that, that naturally, when that happens, there's probably a reluctance for a, a, an operator, an owner of one of those practices, to consider selling. I do think that'll change. We've obviously just seen the NHS targets uh, go up. The, the 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 note before Christmas in England. Um, some operational changes within Scotland as well. So I think that that may well be the catalyst that, that will bring um, some of those biz businesses to the market again. Uh, but but the, the, the good thing is the, the, the buyer market, the demand is there for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, I think that's telling when during the second year of a pandemic, there is that demand for practices and people keen to buy. It, it shows that, um, I mean, hopefully we're coming out of this now. <laughs> So you would think that if that is the case, it was only going to go up rather than down because thankfully the, the most vulnerable economic um, times that they've passed in terms of the pandemic, we hope. So I, I don't like saying it too much. But, um, yeah, yeah, you, you, you'd think that these trends would continue. And um, last year also saw a, a rise in bigger practice transactions. What was the reason for that? Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, th I think they probably they, they've always been in demand. Um, I suppose to make that clear, I, I think they have managed to um, they'd be very good businesses pre-pandemic and arguably become better businesses post-pandemic um, or or in this period as we're as we're coming out. And I think that that's ultimately down to the 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 owners of of that that type of business. They've been quick to. And quick and agile to be able to adapt a business to to work within the environments that we currently have to work, um, yeah. and I, and I again I think those who have recognised some of those larger opportunities in the marketplace, they they tend to offer a bit more flexibility in terms of the revenue streams that are coming into into practice, yeah. um, and and I, I, again when you typically hone in on the the capable buyers of those types of practices. The larger practices tend to hold a, a, a increased turnover, profitability, and therefore a higher value. When you look at who can afford those types of practices, you hone in on the corporate buyer or the multi-site operator, of which that 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 activity, particularly from multi-site operators, really dominating the the market just now. They're looking to to build on their existing portfolios. I think there's more buyers in that category than ever before. So there's a lot of choice there. And I think uh, e equally, uh, hopefully it's down to the job that we're doing when when operators of those types of practices see their their colleagues or ca counterparts selling in the marketplace, it's urging them to, to perhaps do the same because there's some 
fabulous results there in the marketplace for that type of business. Yeah, 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 I can imagine that is the case. Uh, I know you deal with other things other than dentistry at Christine Co as well. How does dentistry compare to these other help, these other sectors that you, um, yeah, you, you manage, you deal with? Mm. Yeah, really good question. Um, I, I think there's, there's similarities on one topic and that's staffing issues just now, it's recruitment. Okay. Um, I think I know that's kind of perceived as a bit of a negative just now, but but equally it's probably reassuring that it's not just contained to the dental sector. Yes. Um, other commercial industries are experiencing the same. Um, so um, I, I think just just generally when we look at um, other sectors that Chris and cooperate within, um, uh, you know, it'd be easy to look at the hospitality market, for example, and, and think that that's been really hard hit in the market, which it which it has. Um, yeah. But a similar theme in terms of transactional activity, the, the demand for those types of businesses, um, particularly the ones that have managed to adapt and, and improve their business through um, the, the, the pandemic, um, just, just being a little bit more flexible, I suppose. Um, mm. So similar analogy, I suppose, when we look at those businesses within the dental world, how quickly they've adapted, um, have attracted the eye of, a, of an investor. So I think I think that will always show that that um, quality will sell. Um, businesses that are priced correctly will drive demand, um, yeah. and ultimately running a process. So when when an owner of one of those businesses, and specifically a dental practice, it, it's sometimes easy just to kind of navigate down the route of um, selling to an associate or one of the corporates who come knocking. Um, I think the important thing to note is because of the demand that's there in the marketplace, um, Chris and Co can run a process uh, for you. Um, and that's that's not about shouting um, about the, the, the practice being for sale to any old buyer. It's still very much a kind of bespoke and targeted approach. Mm. Um, but, but being able to, to facilitate and drive that competition in a, in a competitive process is really helping the, the end result. Um, you know, the prices that are being paid, the terms post-sale particularly. Price is one thing, it's an important matter, but ultimately a, a, a principle staying on post-sale and what the conditions are for that is, is equally important. Who's taking over the practice? It, can, can they continue the legacy that's been created um, and... and and kind of serve staff and patients the, the, the way the business has been formed under the, 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 the original owner, the selling owner. So all of those things really are good for a uh, uh, principle to consider. And with this in mind, how do you think this is going to influence or impact the dental, the value of dental practices over the next two, three, four years? Yeah, it, there's, a, I suppose, a bit of crystal ball gazing with that. But, but if we look at the... If we look at the last eight years, um, the market has just continued to increase northwards. Um, ultimately, that, that is down to demand in the marketplace. Uh, and look, if we've not seen demand tail off or, or pause as a result of the pandemic, it, it gives a bit of confidence that we're probably unlikely to see that demand tail off at all. Yeah. The market's just getting stronger and stronger. The the, the spotlight and the, the news around dentistry, oral health, you know, just healthcare in general has really been um, emphasised as a result of the pandemic. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the consumer, the, the, the spend from you and I, uh, what, what we're looking for as patients effectively, um, I, I think is, is more mainstream than ever before. So, so as long as those businesses are performing well from a, a, a a turnover and profitability perspective, reputational respect, uh, perspective as well. Um, I, I, I see that there's always going to be a buyer there for it. Um, if we look at, I, I suppose it would be easy to think that, that 2021 was a bubble of activity because 2020 um, almost kind of bottomed out or flatlined, so was everything banked into the following year. There was a bit of that, but, but I would say only in, in Q1 of, of last year. Um, the, the, the volume of, of transactions that Christie and Co um, achieved throughout 2021, um, there was a high proportion of which actually came to the market. So the transaction started in Q2 2020, that kind of six month period. Um, and then on to kind of Q3, Q4, 
we've seen new business come to the market, deals being agreed, which ultimately roll into to this year just now. So legal work ongoing, buyer and seller liaising. Um, and, and, and if we look at that pipeline of activity just now, Again, that's that's kind of ro more robust than ever before. So yeah. it, it looks as though what we're going to achieve this year is very much a mirror image, if not better, um, compared to last year again. I mean, that's a very good note to, to finish on, I think, for anybody listening as well. It's, uh, it seems quite hopeful, which I think is something that we um, can never have too much of. So that's a nice, a nice way to round that conversation off. But is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, fantastic. I, as you say, I think good to, to end on that positive note. And, and I suppose I, I've referenced a couple of times operationally, I know for some owners, um, it will feel far from this, this moment of positivity on a day to day basis. There are still challenges within practice, but, but there's options there. Um, you know, I think that's the, the approach that Christie and Co take to, to help anyone, whether it be a seller of a single asset, a, a small group or larger portfolios. Um, there's, there's demand for those types of businesses um, from the, the buyer pool that we're working with just now. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much for coming on today, Paul. My pleasure. Thanks, Gabby.